hear it? Okay, good. I am recording it. I am fine. Yes, okay. So mitochondria and chloroplasts, um, uh, basically those were bacteria. And the evolutionary history of these or organelles is different than, uh, uh, is uh, different from eukaryotic cell itself. So we say that uh, the endosymbiotic theory is how we explain development and progress of eukaryotic cell. And that's why we say that eukaryotic cell is chimera. So there was one host that had some certain structure that ate mitochondria as a energy producing organelles and then it's genetic, then, then eukaryotic cell was genetic chimera. And this is only what shows this, um, there are reasons why we think that. And um, we talked about four of these reasons uh, in the beginning, and today we will just expand it. Like well, how we know that eukaryotic cell developed as genetic chimera after host ingested with mitochondria and chloroplasts. So mitochondria and chloroplasts are energy producing organelles. So what does that mean? So whichever host was, and we think that host was a TL cell, hemorganotropic. So there are different theories, as you remember, hypothesis one and two. Definitely we know that mitochondria and chloroplasts are bacteria that were ingested. And we know because eukaryotic cell, mm, actually eukaryotic cell has in those mitochondria and chloroplasts in plants, uh, there is uh, their own DNA. And that DNA present, so that's in addition to nucleus. So eukaryotic cell has nucleus, and usually DNA in nucleus is organized in very in the complex structures like nucleosomes and different packing or chromosomes. But in mitochondria and chloroplasts, there is another type of DNA which is completely independent from nucleus, and that DNA is actually the same type of prokaryotic, like it has polycystronic uh, uh, transcription translation. And the other thing is. Uh, they have also, mitochondria and chloroplasts have also their own ribosomes. And those ribosomes uh, have uh, structured 70S. I will talk about that in the next slide. There are other ribosomes in eukaryotic cell uh, in cytoscope that are called, that have characteristic ATS. So they are different. But in mitochondria and chloroplasts, there are different set of ribosomes. So, and they do independent, uh, and there is independent transcription and translation that occurs in mitochondria and chloroplasts. Uh, so, that's it. that's why we know that definitely those organisms originate from bacteria. So uh, mitochondria are ancestors of respiratory bacteria, and chloroplasts are ancestors of phototrophic bacteria. Uh, and I have called them color coded, thinking that maybe that would be easier for you. So uh, basically, what happened is that mitochondria and chloroplasts established their residency inside of some other host cell type. So we think that host was an archaea, but we know for sure it was chemoorganotroph. Uh, again, these are all educated guessing because we don't have fossils that we can study, so we can only conclude so much. Uh, so the point is that host cell gave them a stable home, and mitochondria and chloroplast gave to the host cell production of ATP. So, and this is, we call that uh, endosymbiotic uh, hypothesis. So uh, this is, you see the ancestral pro prokaryotes. It was, again, there are theories that it's archaeal host. Then the, we saw those infolding soft membrane, which made a space for entrance of cyanobacteria and uh, mitochondria, and they established their existence into the ancestral eukaryotic organism. That's why we call we say that the uh, eukaryotic cell is um, and uh, is the genetic hybrid. And there are a few reasons why uh, why endosymbiotic theory makes sense. Uh, and I'm giving you here five of them, the most important, and I will explain each of them in detail. Some of them we covered in first lecture, um, actually second lecture first year. So first one. The, the fact that mitochondria and chloroplasts contain their own DNA, and that DNA is very similar to prokaryotic. Second, eukaryotic nucleus also contains some genes that are derived from bacteria. So it's like exchange of genetic material inside of the cell. And nowadays with sequencing, we can actually find bacterial uh, homologs in eukaryotic genome. 
uh, ribosomes, as I said, in special ribosomes in um, eukaryotic cell in mitochondria and chloroplasts, specificity for antibiotics, again, we will see in the next slide, and hydrogenome, hydrogenosomes, the existence of hydrogenosomes, specific organelles, which we will cover in a sec. Um, so, uh, first one, the existence of mitochondria, of DNA, mitochondria, and corpus. So, most of my, uh, proteins, in mitochondria and chloroplasts are actually encoded by nuclear DNA. So because they established that so-called parasitic form of life when they were in a, ingested by hosts, literally they relied on the nuclear machinery. But there are many significant molecules that are coded by prokaryotic, um, by, by mitochondrial genome itself. And those are uh, respiratory chain proteins. Uh, photosynthetic pro, uh, apparat apparatus proteins and rRNA and tRNA. So these three are actually coded by mitochondrial or chloroplastic uh, genome, uh, while the rest is coded by nucleus. Probably, in my opinion, the most important evidence is the. Somebody, do you have a question? No, I, I, maybe I saw it. The most important evidence for me, at least, is that um, mitochondria and chloroplasts contain circular DNA and covalently closed, uh, which is prokaryotic feature. So it's like a uh, it definitely DNA that that same like in bacteria. So definitely mitochondria and chloroplasts used to be bacteria. Now, second one is. Uh, the, the fact that nucleus in eukaryotic cells contain some genes that are derived from bacteria. So the existence of um, mitochondrial and chloroplast or bacterial genes in eukaryotic genome actually indicates that ancestors, which are mitochondria and chloroplast, had those genes. And then the, the engulfed cell showed up like after, after they were after the host to bacterial cell, and then genes were transferred to nucleus during transition. So it wouldn't be called horizontal gene transfer, but there is exchange of genes. So if we rem if you remember that we talked about the recombinations and mutations in first lectures, so it's a source of diversity. So uh, similar type happened in ancient evolution, and it still happens. So that's something that still exists. Um. Third process, third reason is the the, uh, the fact that uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts have uh, ribosomes that have uh, that have a sedimentation constant 70s, smaller ribosomes. And I put here definition uh, what 70s, Swedberg constant means. So that basically means the speed or how fast molecules move in centrifuge for people who are, who didn't have microbiology background just to know what 70s means. So what that means is that bacteria have smaller 70s ribosomes while eukaryotic ribosomes are 80s. Mm -hmm. But mitochondria and chloroplasts actually have their own ribosomes, which are 70s. So uh, eukaryotic cell has also 80s ribosomes in cytosome, uh, but in mitochondria, they have 70s ribosomes. So pretty much bacterial uh, ribosomes. Mm. And then even more evidence is antibiotic specificity. So you have a set of antibiotics that kill bacteria cell by interrupting uh, ribosomal biosynthesis. Like they are literally affected 70s ribosomes. So if you test antibiotics on isolated mitochondria and chloroplasts, they will have the same effect on them. So again, those are bacteria. That's why antibiotics kill them. Antibiotic doesn't kill eukaryotes, but it kills mitochondria and chloroplasts in eukaryotes. So that's another theory. And the last but not least are hydrogenosomes. So those are membrane enclosed or organelles, uh, and they also contain uh, their own DNA and ribosomes. So they're all to mitochondria. They're also energy produce, uh, producing uh, organelles. So there are certain organisms that uh, don't have mitochondria. We call them amitochondrial eukaryotic anaerobes, but they have hydrogens, hydrogenosomes. Uh, 
so they are pretty much analog to mitochondria, just they uh, intake hydrogen and oxidize and they're anaerobic. So um, phylogenetic analysis of hydrogenosome uh, rRNA showed that they are actually bacterial. So those are some hydrogen oxidizing bacteria. So that tells that another uh, fact that go, they go to support primary endosymbiosis, which is an event that we already covered in first lecture. So there is a primary and there is secondary endosymbiosis. So we, you know, we constantly talk about this primary endosymbiosis and we always mention these three types of organelles, mitochondria, chloroplast, and hydrogen. So these are definitely derived from bacteria. Then you had a host that had those in membrane invagination and the establishment of mitochondria and chloroplast in them. And this was a primary endosymbiosis that literally gave a rise to the chloroplast in a uh, common ancestor of, in the, with, to the chloroplast or in the common ancestor of green algae, red algae, and plants. And then common ancestor plus chloroplast that basically gives you those algae. So, but then what happens is secondary endosymbiosis. So now you have green algae, red algae. So then, so that's what, so they, they developed by primary symbiosis. Then green algae, red algae cell that happen with common ancestor plus chloroplast. Those cells were then engulfed and chloroplast were stably retained. And then new cells become phototrophic. So the presence of chloroplasts in these eugenids and the flora, these algae that I cannot pronounce, uh, is uh, explained through symbiotic events. So uh, to secondary endosymbiotic events. So primary endosymbiosis gave rise to the uh, cyanobacteria, to the to, cyanob to red and green algae, not cyanobacteria, sorry. And then all those higher algae. Uh, actually developed through uh, endosymbiosis, but it was again, in, like intake of cells formed through primary endosymbiosis, which are so green and red algae engulfed by the host. Mm. Uh, so in terms of uh, phylogeny, we know now, and again, I will give this hint later on when I talk about the exam, uh, we know now that eukaryotes are way more similar to archaea than to bacteria, which if you remember that table at the end of first lecture, so I suggest you to look that table and to know the table, which are differences between eukaryotic and bacteria, eukaryotic like three domains of life. Now, but phylogenetic history, uh, or if if you do phylogenetic history, uh, for, uh, phylogenetic history of eukaryotic cell through 18S rRNA, and what is 18S? So 18S is a smaller, so the same how you have in bacteria 16S rRNA, which is a component of small ribosomal subunit. And we use that 16S rRNA to study uh, microorganisms, uh, to study evolutionary history of microorganisms because those molecules are uh, highly stable, very conservative, 16S rRNA. That's how you can identify evolution history and make phylogenetic tree. So if you do the, if you, so 18S is analog to 16S just in eukaryotes. But 18S in eukaryotes is not really reliable as 16S rRNA. So if you try, so that's why uh, it's usually recommended to use different genes in eukaryotic microorganisms for phylogenetic tree. Uh, same like if you remember when we talked about um, uh, nitrogen fixators, uh, they use, so if you do 16S rRNA uh, phylogenetic tree, you won't get too much diversity, but if you do, um, if you do uh, nitrogenase, that one is hardly there. There are 30,000 different nitrogenase, so you'll get better diversity. Um, so microbial eukaryotes, so again, they're microorganisms, they contain either mitochondria or hydrogenosomes as energy producing organisms, or some DNA traces of this structure. And um, mitochondria or similar structure gave a basically new metabolic capacities, like respiring metabolism to the eukaryotic cell. 
And the fact that there was new metabolic capacity actually uh, triggered a enormous evolutionary branching of eukaryotic cells. So, and if you remember that all happened after there was enough oxygen and enough oxygen was accumulated after big oxygenation event. So primary endosymbiotic event it was probably triggered by oxygen accumulation uh, produced after um, photosynthesis. And we now know that even though cyanobacteria existed 2.8 billion years ago, uh, because there were those iron band, because there was so much iron that was oxidized, we got formed the iron band, banded iron formation. And until all iron was exhausted, no more banded iron formation, then all oxygen that was accumulated can uh, could actually trigger primary endosymbiotic event. Primary endosymbiotic event gave a stable gave, gave what gave a stable rise to the new eukaryotic cell, which ingested mitochondria and chloroplast, and then that led to the secondary uh, endosymbiotic events, which led to the formation of higher algae and plants, etc., and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, so what we can learn today, what we can clearly state uh, about the evolution of eukaryotic microorganisms is that we should make uh, something called composite phylogenetic tree. So that is not based only on 18S rRNA. It should be based on other genes. Nora will teach you how to do um, microbes prokaryotes, uh, and you will use 16S rRNA. So she has a software that she will share with you uh, at the end of the class, and she will you 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 do she already grouped you, and she will show you how to you will do that in groups. You will find your you will form your own phylogenetic tree. So once when you have that software and when you learn how to go to NCBI and find genes, you can play and try to make phylogenetic tree uh, from eukaryotic microorganisms and see how bad it looks if you if you use only 18S rRNA. Mm. And second thing that we can say is that primary eukaryotes. Uh, acquired actually mitochondria because that was, uh, uh, and that was a key of evolutionary success because mitochondria were respiring um, microorganisms. And when new cell uh, took mitochondria and gulped it, it gained new metabolic capab capabilities, which involve oxygen. Now there was enough oxygen. And then there was enormous branching that, that, that led to the formation of all of us in the end. So, and microbial eukaryotes are called protists. Did you hear about protists? Even in ancient time, one, uh, one of the, not first, but the second phylogenetic tree was formed, would recognize protists as um, a special kingdom. Those are el microbial eukaryotes. And there are seven groups. So imagine if I ask you for each of them to tell me the name of the organism, that would be too much. Uh, you probably already heard about amebozoa. You know, everyone heard about amoeba, right? That's pretty much a famous organism. Uh, Radiolaria syncercozoans, um, another group you will see that kind of interesting. Staminopil, salvelate. You heard about euglenozoa. If you heard about euglena viridis, the one that has a little um, whip at the end, is that how it's called? How you saw? How, what do you say? Sorry? Yes, flagellum, thank you. But I don't know if it's called flagellum. I don't know how it's called. In, I, it has special, in Serbian language, we call that whip. So actually, there is this. <laughs> the, yeah, so we, we had a very funny name for Euglena called whip, whipper. But yeah, it's a, that's how I memorized. Like, I was never good with classic names. I, I, I was horrible. And then I made all sorts of associations, like how I will memorize something. Some of them had very funny connotation that was not really decent. But I learned it and I never forget. So, like, it means something else. So, yeah. The interesting fact, I will teach you those things when we finish class. Then I will tell you. Now I can't. Uh, not a lot. But there are funny ways to memorize that. You never forget. You just connect that with something, and it never goes away, even twenty years after. Uh, believe me, I will give you examples once when we meet in bar after class is over. 
I can't now. Uh, now I have to tell you about Diplomonadas. The name Diplo will tell you that they have two nuclei. Diplo, two. That's their characteristic. Uh, they have something, they have reduced mitochondria that do not have uh, electron transport chain. And those reduced mitochondria are called my, uh, mitosomes or mitosomes. So, and they lack uh, genes for many metabolic pathways. So those are only characters. I'm not asking any species to memorize. Parabasalides. So you will memorize this because there is this organism, Trichomonas vaginalis. Who heard about Trichomonas vaginalis? Some of them, some, probably some of us had the honor to meet this stupid organism. So yeah, it sucks. Uh, so this is sexual really transmitted disease. So God help me can get you cancer later on. It's really bad. Um, but the way what the, the how you will memorize parabasalides is because they have parabasal body. Um, and that's just the structural support for Golgi apparatus. They also don't have mitochondria, but they have hydrogenosomes. This is one of them. This is their landmark. So again, the Comunas vaginalis I don't will ever forget. Uh, Euglenozoas, example is Euglena, the one that has a whip or flagellum at the end. And there are two types of Euglenozoas. Uh, they're called Euglenid and Kinetoplastid. So Kinetoplastid is um, basically a structure, like a mass of DNA in single large mitochondria. And, the Eugle, uh, and that's one group of Euglen, Euglenozoas. The another group, group, which is characteristic for this is Euglena viridis, Euglenid, they have a chlo chloroplast and flagellum, uh, and they feed on bacteria uh, through phagocytosis. So when I studied the molecular biology, which was, I started in 2005, uh, and I graduated with bachelor in 2009. So when I took this class, uh, Euglena was considered, so in my book, it was in plants, like algae. Uh, and the professor who was, oh my God, she was old. Like, I think she went to school with Caesar. That's how old she was. Uh, she was, who? She was, she was talking about that and she was convinced that Euglena is actually algae. And that's what she taught us, like, mm. That's how she probably learned in her time and then she was ancient. But it's not that the Euglena is actually protist. And the reason why people thought that it's uh, um, algae is because it has chloroplast. So people are like, okay, this must be some sort of algae. It's not. So at the time, actually, so when I studied, some of you were kids, you, maybe you were just born. Uh, we also thought, so cyanobacteria were called cyanoalgae and uh, were studied as a part of um, algae uh, biology, not as a part of microbiology, because people thought that they are actually, they belong to algae. They're bacteria. They have, now we know that it's established because they, are, they don't have nuclear, they cannot be prokaryotic, they're not algae, they're bacteria. That's why now we don't call them cyanoalgae, but I learned all about them as a cyanoalgae, but they are actually cyanobacteria. Those things are really changing, uh, uh, and it should that's it, especially since we have uh, DNA sequencing, you can place the organisms very correctly in specific phylogenetic based on their DNA. Mm -hmm. So, Euglena, this is a picture of Euglena under microscope, um, is phototrophic, contains chloroplast. Uh, in dark, in, it simply loses chloroplast and becomes chemoorganotrophic. Mm. And Euglena is famous by its phagocytosis. So phagocytosis is a process which literally includes surrounding a particle with a portion of flexible cytoplasmic membrane and then engulfs the particle and bring it to the cell. So like pretty much does something what uh, immune, immune cells do when they find antigens. So the, you, did you hear about phagocytosis? Yeah, so these, these people, these are people, these organisms do the same thing. Alveolates um, are not, so the name comes up from the fact that they have like a little sacs in cytoplasm that are called alveoli. So 
you will memorize that because in lungs you have alveoli. Uh, and the, the reason why they have alveoli is to help them to maintain osmotic balance. So uh, they usually control water influx and reflux. So that's why they are like arranged the, like the on the cytoplasmic membrane. There are a few types of alveolates. Uh, we briefly mentioned ciliates, uh, dinoflagellates, and uh, apicomplexans. Uh, dinoflagellates is something that you probably heard mostly about. Um, I'm not really sure. Alveolates that is known as a ciliate is paramecium. How many of you heard about paramecium? Everyone, exactly. In Serbia, actually, if you want to offend someone, you, you tell him, you paramecium basically means you're a lower level creature. It's like you're, uh, you're sig less significant than amoeba or paramecium. And I don't think that people actually know what paramecium is, but they heard that sometimes in biology and they decided it's a cool word, uh, which is characteristic of non-educated people. Uh, so but I just want you to know that it's paramecium. Then the next one, and this one you probably know, dinoflagellates. Did you see this, these red dyes? So there's the dinoflagellates, which are type of alveolates, is forming these red dyes, which are in coastal polluted areas. So this is algal blooming. So these red things are white dinoflagellates. And last but not least is the one that I really hate to pronounce, apicomplexans, but it's easy to memorize because it's toxoplasma gondii. And some plasmodium species that are causing malaria. But um, toxoplasma, did you hear about toxoplasma? Okay. So, toxoplasma, oh my God, somebody brought me the toxoplasma and bacteria in my midterm exam. Toxoplasma is this thing. It's okay. So, it's microbial bacteria. So, yes, I, I get very emotional when I read that. Then I have to go to contemplate a little bit. Same like when somebody said that my that bacteria have two electron transport chains, one on mitochondria, the other on a cell membrane. I'm like, okay, fine. You don't know endosymbiotic theory. Take my class, please, um, before you go to grad school. <laughs> so anyway, what is characteristic uh, about um, uh, toxoplasma and plasmodiums is that they have sporozoids uh, and sort of pores. And they're used to transmit uh, for transmission uh, parasites to new hosts. I did some research uh, uh, actually on Toxoplasma gondii, and uh, it, again, I'm not going to ask this. I'm just giving you as a fun fact. Um, it actually makes cysts in brain, and uh, when you cut my brain that was in, uh, infected uh, with, uh, I did that, yeah, personally. You you literally have to count how many cysts you see in the brain. It's quite a dangerous parasite, and if you are pregnant it can actually cause serious uh, fetus defects but the key is if you because it um, toxoplasma lives in cats its cats are like natural transmit uh, nat natural hosts it doesn't affect them but if you have never been exposed to cat and you get pregnant and then you get toxoplasma you you will lose uh, you will use fetus which means since i grew up with 17 cats at least I was good. I could still pet cats even when I was pregnant. I don't care. I think I would die if I didn't. But God, I cannot live without cats. See, that's what I'm telling you. I'm transferring to cats. Cats are way more grateful than children. They love you and they don't talk back ever. And they're quiet when you want to study and to do your work. They don't jump on you. I mean, they jump, but they don't ask you anything. They just sit there, which is what I like. Anyway, fifth one, staminophils. Uh, did you hear about diatoms? Pretty much all mycetes and golden and brown algae. Very briefly. I'm mentioning this very, very briefly. Uh, diatoms are unicellular. This is a picture. They look very colorful. They look like some, some ornament, like a... I'm not an artist, artist, but this looks very nice to me. Uh, they're phototrophic microbial eukaryotes. They're plankton, plankton micro, microbial community in marine and fresh waters. So these are diatomes. All mycetes, again, staminophils, that's water mold. 
that's all what you want to know. And golden and brown algae, again, I'm just mentioning, but I'm not going to teach about this. There is, this is microbial, microbial class. Uh, golden algae are called chrysophytes, and the brown algae are actually not micro, they are macroscopic algae. So I'm not, that's why I'm not teaching about them, because they are not microbes. So after staminopils, we have cercozoans and radiolarias. So these are foraminifers. So uh, there is a special type of benthic for, uh, uh, again, I'm not going to ask you this, I'm just giving you a fun fact. Uh, special types of benthic foraminifer that uh, does eukaryotic denitrification or respiration of nitrite. And guess where nitrific the, uh, guess where uh, respiration of nitrite is happening in this organism? In which organelle? In mitochondria, because that's where energy production is happening. These are they, they are they're exclusively marine shell-like structures. Um, and the last but not least, this should be seven. I don't know why I wrote number eight. Uh, amoebas. Pseudopod they use pseudopodia for movement, and there are two types of amoeba: gym gymnamoeba and entamoeba. Uh, entamoeba are uh, parasites, uh, and gymna gym gymnamoeba are free living protists in soil environment. They are not uh, parasites. Entamoeba. So there is a. I'm not asking you to memorize that name, but. It's called amoeba paralytica. So it's a it, it's pathogenic organism. Uh, so, and th that's pretty much all about uh, protists. And now fungi. Again, because I'm, I, I believe that you learn about fungi in different class. That's how I was told that I shouldn't talk too much about fungi. Uh, I have only one slide. So again, even an old phylogenetic a tree formed by Carl Woos, you he recognized fungi as a special or a type of uh, organisms, and they are special, uh, and they are very large and diverse group of organisms. So, the, and then the, can you ever imagine that yeast and mushroom belong to the same group of organisms? So they're completely different morphology and mold also. So molds, mushrooms, yeast, they are all belong to fungi, but they are all so morphologically different. And uh, 100,000 species was, uh, is mm. uh, described, and they're completely different phylogenetic cluster than other protists. Uh, and um, they are microbial, so these are very special microbial group that is mostly related to animals. Uh, they will, you will find them in soil, close to the dead, ma uh, dead plant matter, and they play critical role in mineralization of organic carbon. So. Uh, apparently, I have two slides, <laughs> probably because I divided it on two. I, I remember getting an advice that my slides are too crowded, so I separated it. Uh, many of them are plant pathogens. Did you hear about Candida? Oh, no, that, that's actually okay, our pathogen, but they're also plant pathogens. They Many of them cause disease in us. Um, many of them are, uh, are symbionts of plants uh, and Yeast is actually used widely to in, in microbial biotechnology to make beer. So that's a fungi, and it's heavily engineered. So we have a lot of use of it, and also baker's yeast. And yeast is very famous as a producer of bioethanol for biofuels, the, the one that we blend with the gasoline so we can reduce carbon dioxide emission. And the last, what I'm mentioning here is very small green and colonial green algae. So did you ever hear about this organism, Volvox? So it looks like a big shiny ball that floats in the ocean. And it's literally called, so it is, so I, you know how I memorize that as a confederation of cells. So each cell is independent, but they travel together. So they're like US states. So each state has their own regulation, but in the end, they're all together and they show up publicly together. So some cell, and, and there is division of labor. Some of them are carrying photosynthesis, other cells are doing reproduction. This is how, uh, or, uh, how this organism looks. And uh, they are the reason why I have it here, that's green algae. The reason why I have it here, even though it's not, um, it is not, it is not unicellular, so, but it's still, each of these individual cells can be considered microbe, and then they form a colony. 
And if you look back in what we learned about microbes, if you remember mixobacteria, they also form a fruiting body. So every single uh, mixobacteria, just they form a tree, something that has like a tree structure. This one has like a circular, like a ball structure. So I've kind of found that ball look very interesting. Uh, and uh, in summary, uh, any questions so far? So, uh, he, uh, oh, yes, Liam. Uh, so, they don't have radiolarians. I, 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 I'm not going to talk to you about it. Why? Did you want to know? Okay, then you and me can talk about it. I have it in non-reduced version, but it's a lot. So, I just reduced it because I thought it would be too much. But yes, I can... I have that in my non-reduced version of slides. So again, there are people like Liam who are interested and for them I provide that additional information, but I'm not bothering all of you with radiolarius, even though I found them very interesting. Um, in summary, uh, there is a key of, so key metabolic organs of eukaryotes are chloroplast and mitochondria or hydrogenosomes. Uh, chloroplast function in photosynthesis and mitochondria or hydrogenosomes in respiration. Um, I should remove fermentation because it's they, technically they don't really function in fermentation, but since there are some, I mean, in yeast they do, so I better leave it. But fermentation, I do want you to know, you'll see now when we do review, fermentation is quite different fermentation means no respiration and energy is generated through substrate level phosphorylation. Uh, chloroplast mitochondria and hydrogenosomes were originally bacteria and then they got, uh, then they got uh, established uh, their permanent residency inside of uh, uh, some other cell, which is endosymbiosis. Uh, ribosomal RNA cannot be used uh, to generate reliable phylogenetic tree of eukaryotes. So you have to use different genes uh, to get, so basically to get the reliable phylogenetic tree, you can use different genes. Diplomonads are unicellular, are unicellular uh, flagellar process. The, the characteristic is they have two nuclei. Parabasalis is trichomonas vaginalis. Uh, it's human pathogen. It has a large genome that contains, inter that doesn't have introns. Euglenas are unicellular flagellated process. Trypanosoma is example. I added that in summary, even though I didn't put it on slide. Uh, so basically there are two trypanosoma pathogenic and Euglena non-pathogenic. Uh, then three other groups. Uh, so uh, then the group of alveolates has uh, three other types, ciliates, dinoflagellates, and apicomplexants. Apicomplexants is toxoplasma, dinoflagellates are red tide, and ciliates uh, is paramecium. Uh, staminophils are oomycetes, which are water molds, diatoms, which are diatomic algids, uh, and brown and gold algids. Brown algae are macroscopic, so we are not talking about them. Amebozoas are Protein that contain pseudopodia, and there is entameba and gymnameba. Entameba is pathogenic, uh, and fungi include mold, mushroom, and yeast, all phylogenetic, all morphologically different. And that would be all for um, the lecture. And now uh, I will continue talking about the exam. So Again, I will record the virus. So this doesn't go to exam. So this and viruses, uh, we established that we go to till, like only archaea are additional lecture that goes to the micro, to the final, to the final, to the mister God. Okay. So are we ready for taking notes? Okay. I'm open. So I am going to stop uh, this recording.